All right. All right, welcome to Deploying, Scaling, Running Grails on AWS and VPC. I'm Ryan Vanderwerf. Uh, I'm a software engineer on the Grails team at OCI. Father of two kiddos under 13. I co-chair a local user group uh, for Grooving and Grails. I've co-authored an uh, uh, effective Gradle implementation video series with uh, my buddy Lee over there. And um, I'm sort of a hacker of all kinds of hardware and software things, any from cars to phones to gadgets or whatever. Um, I do a lot of uh, DevOps Linux stuff in my past uh, before I did that. I do also do a lot of conversational AI with Google Home and uh, Alexa um, and about OCI. So uh, if you need any kind of groovy or grail support, we can help. So be sure to stop by the booth. All right, what are we going to cover? So I'm going to cover some VPC network basics. Uh, and Amazon and explain kind of what that is. And I'll explain some of the terms too for people that are new here. How many people here are already f use Amazon Web Services today? All right, so almost half. So forgive me for some vocabulary, but uh, I think it's helpful for people that don't. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about S3 Storage Service. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Grails 3 AWS plugins and uh, some Gradle plugins that are useful since Grails 3 is based on Gradle. A lot of plugins have shifted uh, to there. Uh, a little bit about Sugar, which there's a talk right after this. Um, be sure to come by his talk for the full uh, rundown of it. I'll just give an overview. I'll talk a little bit about using elastic load balancers with your application, and I'll just kind of give you some other miscellaneous tips of things I've picked up over the last few years. All right, so what is VPC? It's a virtual private cloud. So um, when Amazon first started, they didn't really have such a concept. It was just called EC, they, what they call now EC2 Classic. So they were just machines running out on the internet, and they had public IP addresses, and it was up to the developers and network guys to defend them from attacks from anything else. And there wasn't really any kind of firewall or, or traditional uh, firewall to, with, that you would think of at the networking layer. So they came up with this thing called the virtual private cloud, and it gives you like a virtual network with a firewall, routing, subnets, all of that stuff to you know, give you a more proper uh, security infrastructure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about proper infrastructure, right? So once you've created a VPC and you've started spinning up machines on them, um, maybe you haven't, not everyone on your team has been disciplined about uh, doing DevOps tools to where they spin things up automatically or not. Uh, it can be really hard to go back and fix that when you've got a bunch of machines on there that you have to do possibly manual work to move. So that's, I think that's important, and it helps you understand a layer below kind of where you work on a day-to-day -day basis if you're just a Groovy Grails developer. I'll talk a little bit about routing, uh, how NAT works on it, uh, some ACL firewall rules, uh, suggested layout of some subnets in the VPC, uh, and a little bit about security groups, a couple DHCP tips, uh, flow logs, and S3 endpoints. Uh, a little bit about peering, and something called Classic Link. All right. So some terms here. So a region in, a in Amazon is sort of a geographic region that consists of a group of availability zones. So like a region is US East or EU West, and then there's availability zones inside of that that are uh, individual places you can place servers. And that availability zone is really a collection of data centers, and they're usually geographically somewhat close, but not too close. And when you say your, your multi-availability zone, that's just basically the ability to spread your application across those availability zones within a region. Uh, subnet is just a group of IP addresses that are addressed as a block. And then they, they also use the term a lot, CIDR block. So that's the higher level block of many addresses and subnets that they give you when you create a VPC. All right, some of the AWS servers, so let me do some vocabulary here so everyone's familiar uh, with what I'm referring to in the talk. Uh, Route 53 is Amazon's DNS service. Uh, EC2 is their compute service. S3 is their simple storage service. It's object-based storage. Uh, EBS is called Elastic Block Storage. It's kind of like a network-attached hard disk uh, type of concept. Uh, Lambda is Amazon's serverless application system. And Elastic Load Balancer, ELB. And then there's also something called an ALB, which is sort of an extended concept of that called Application Load Balancer. So here's what regions look like. We've got 
Um, these are all regions around the world right here. So we've got quite a few, and it's always growing. And then here's the how availability zones you know go into that. So you've got your region, and then you've got this is a, a region here, and then we've got availability zones in here. So this one's got, for example, three. You know, Japan's got three. Uh, U.S. East has got four, um, and that's how they're broken up. When you think about things logically, where they go, there's a lot of limitations on things where um, there isn't a there's some support, but not a ton to go between regions because there's usually not any kind of fat pipe between them for Amazon. So then that traffic would be most likely going over the internet. Um, not all cloud providers have that limitation. I know Oracle, um, for theirs, they actually laid their own undersea cable uh, to go between US and um, Europe. And I can't even comprehend how expensive something like that would be. Uh. All right, so let's talk a little bit about VPCs here. Uh, it's required on AWS accounts. So they kind of had a transition period where it was like, okay, you have no VPC, just you know, defend yourself the best you can. And then they created a VPC, but it was optional. And then it kind of slowly transitioned um, to where you basically have to uh, create a VPC. And it doesn't cost any money. So you can create a VPC with as many subnets as you like. Uh, they're all like private internal IP addresses anyway, so it doesn't cost them anything either. Uh, the only price that gets into play is if you've got a NAT instance spun up. That's going to be, and I'll talk about how that works. All right, here, so here's kind of a basic uh, routing subnet type of, type of setup here. So if I create a two subnet thing in the wizard when I create a new VPC, I've got, uh, I've, I've picked a two subnet system. This is one of the defaults. There's either one or, or two usually. And one of the defaults is that it spins up an EC2 box. It's a NAT instance. You can't control what it really does. It's just sort of a black box that spins up. And that's the only cost you would have associated with the VPC directly is, is whatever this is. And sometimes you run in a situation where you might need to upgrade it. If you're pumping large amounts of traffic from your secure subnets, uh, they could be bottlenecked uh, going outbound by the speed or network speed of that instance. And so I have seen some cases where you need to upgrade it. Um, so here's our DMZ. This is their outward facing subnet. So you're only going to put things that um, would be directly touching end users. Um, so you shouldn't need too many of those. And then your secure subnet is like where you put all your database servers and more high value assets. Uh, you've got a layer of protection with the VBC. You've got firewall rules and all that. So when we add in some uh, routing and subnet, so here's uh, what I recommend usually is uh, create this. Yeah, an add instance is great. Uh, secure subnet here, and then you put your highest value assets here, and then you put uh, all of your front end services in a second subnet. And that way you can route everything through here, um, and nothing's really directly exposed uh, to, the, to the internet. And I think that's a bit safer, uh, just reducing your attack surface that someone could get at you. So that third subnet really gives you a helping hand. Uh, it's easier to put auto-scaling instances that can access the internet through the NAT there. Uh, that's where you put your web services and all that. And it also makes it easier to run OS updates. Uh, when you've got things on that DMZ, um, sometimes the routing can be a little bit squirrely to set up to um, get outbound access uh, to run like Ubuntu updates or something like that. If you're uh, manually managing servers or when things get spun up, they need to connect uh, to the outside internet and grab things. Uh, it also makes it easier to have S3 buckets accessible and keep your network secure. So here we can take things to another level here where we get redundancy. So uh, if you want to say, I want to be multi uh, you know, availability uh, zone, you would have your VPC here, and then you access things like uh, you know, the storage service, Route 53, and then you put a load balancer in here. And at that point, we've got duplicated. You know, This would be US East 1A. This would be US 1A VPC for my database. And then maybe I would put something in uh, uh, B or C, or something like that here. So I've got redundancy. So you can add different subnets on different availability zones now in VPC. So <clears throat> you can really have a really good uptime uh, percentage. That's something that um, when I was doing a lot of DevOps stuff was I would get pressure from the executive team and the board about how many nines can we be, right? And most of them had unrealistic expectations of that because they didn't understand how much money goes into redundancy and things like that. 
So it was always a constant battle. But you can get you know pretty close, I think, in a, with a reasonable price. So if you create four subnets, two across two, like I just showed you there, uh, that's a pretty good way to go. And always uh, make sure your S3 buckets are accessible. Uh, always use Route 53 health checks for everything as a failover. So you can then fail over to another region that way or um, have a sorry server page. I've seen so many people have sorry server pages uh, trying to bring them up at the last minute after their website's been down for 20 plus minutes. And then like, oh no, we, users are just seeing a, a stuck loading page or 500 server error. What are we gonna do until we figure this out? You need to have that sorry server page with Route 53 set up ahead of time with some kind of static thing of, uh, sorry, we're having to technical difficulties be back soon. So at least users have some idea what's going on. And you can put that static site in an S3 bucket. And that's, you, know, you can set all that up to Route 53. Uh, you can also do something called uh, VPC peering. So you can maybe you're running a, a big SaaS application and for whatever reason you have a requirement that every customer has their own VPC and their own sets of servers and they don't want anything touching whatsoever, no, no multi-tenancy. You can use VPC peering uh, to set that up where you can link these VPCs together. And um, here's kind of a, a little bit of an example of that here, but um, I can use the VPC router and then I can hook that up there and then uh, these are all the things inside of my subnet here. And then um, we can go outside to another VPC and link that to the, together. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, routing and subnets. So this is, if, uh, how many people here are familiar with uh, back in the day where you had like a, maybe a Cisco load balancer or a level F5 or something like that, where you set all that stuff up manually? That's, uh, so I got one, one person, so showing my age. But now you can do all this stuff. It's so much easier to deal with than uh, learning all that. You can do it all here in a net with nice routing tables and subnets. And in that case, we've got um, our subnets created here. And then we tell it what CIDR block it goes to, which is uh, those big blocks of private IP addresses it gives you when you create it. Uh, so all your IP addresses are going to be something in that range. Um, and then we can get down and drill down in the level here where we've got uh, our routing table and we've got network ACLs. So now we've got firewall rules for each uh, uh, subnet and we can specify what ports are allowed in and out. And these, are, uh, these don't understand state. So that means you have to specifically support anything inbound and anything outbound. It's not automatic. You say, I want HTTPS and it understands that it goes both directions. That's like security groups work. And the order of these is important. So uh, usually when you add stuff, you want to not, not, not do it sequentially because it does process these in the number order as far as uh, priority. All right, security ACLs. They're just acting like a normal firewall, uh, unlike the security groups. Uh, you protect all of your subnets. Um, instead of leaving that up to security groups on EC2 instances by themselves. So this is kind of your first line of defense against the internet um, to protect all of your assets. Uh, there are sometimes weird things. Uh, I've had weird requirements of people that for whatever reason refuse to use a VPN and you have to let uh, various clients for OSs, you have to open up some ports, ranges anywhere in the range of 1024 to um, 65535. But uh, by default, you should block all of those, uh, all of these ports here. Those, that's usually where holes are. So uh, these VPC security groups, they have security groups here uh, that are on the, on the console on the left. Those are a bit different than EC2 security groups. Uh, one thing that you want to be sure is to name them with a different naming scheme so people don't get them confused. I've had more than one time where a developer had got in and kind of knew enough to be dangerous, would uh, mess with the wrong ones, or maybe someone set them up poorly and named them in two places with the exact same name, so then you don't know which one you're looking at. So uh, be sure to try to do that. And you can also use security groups uh, in, in these rules as well to refer to themselves. Uh, that's a lot better than manually putting IP address ranges in because maybe if you have to change them later, you can, uh, if a security group ID is there, uh, it, it's uh, abstracted a little bit. All right. Uh, a couple other things you can do. So by default, 
uh, when you create machine EC2 instances under a VPC, it's going to call them like EC2 dot internal is their host name and their domain name. Uh, that might not be you know advantageous for you, so you can set some DHCP options on your VPC and use your own uh, DNS if you want, uh, or the ex or an external service that you've got set up that will uh, address uh, host names with the IPs of something more intelligent, like maybe it's an internal real subnet that your company recognizes. Uh, you can only set one at a time on the web UI. That may have been that may have changed recently. And you can also set NetBIOS and NTP servers on your own too, as well. So when those things are assigned out, it's getting you know things like time from there. And this is kind of the format we use here: is uh, semicolon split um, parameters. All right. Another thing that's important is VPC flow logs. So if you do have some kind of intrusion, uh, you're going to need this to um, have a record if you knew you even had one. So you wouldn't be able to see. Um, what's going on. So you can log all your VPC traffic coming in in the CloudWatch logs, and uh, that's pretty valuable, I think, because it used to be, they used to not even have this feature. So when I would go get uh, security audits from uh, potential clients, they would want to know, where are my firewall logs? And I'd have to say, well, we're on Amazon, and we don't have any, because they don't give them to you. And that was really, they didn't really like that answer very much. Uh, so now you can do that. Uh, you've been able to do that for a couple of years. And you can log uh, everything but DNS traffic, Windows license activation, and DHCP traffic. Um, I'm guessing the Windows license stuff, they don't want you to log, because you could possibly intercept things and bypass uh, Windows licensing if you're cursed with such servers. Uh, there's also tools now that have, uh, people have made to ingest these logs and then bring that in to uh, do analysis on it or preventative analysis. Maybe then you could look at these logs and then something could detect an attack is happening and then start blocking uh, firewall ports for you in that case. So Sumo Logic has something that does that, and there are some examples out there of using your ELK stack uh, to bring that into your, with the rest of your logs in your application. So uh, the IDS solution, I think, is a pretty good product uh, idea. Uh, they already had hardware appliances that do this when you have your own hosting of data center services. All right, uh, there's another thing you can do called peering. Uh, so you can link uh, VPCs together across availability zones. Uh, you can't do it across regions, though. Um, you probably wouldn't want to, because the connection may or may not be fast, depending on which region you're going from and to. So, um, but always they have fat pipes between the availability zones. So in those smaller cluster of servers in a region, they've got their own dedicated lines that are really fast going between them, so it's much, much better response time. Um, just make sure you don't have overlapping CIDR blocks, so if you were to create a VPC in one case, a VPC in another case, and use the default subnets and CIDR blocks, now you can't link them together because now the, all the addresses conflict. And so better learn that now ahead of time than after you've created this stuff and then you're having to re-IP address and re-subnet one of, one of those two things if they need to be connected together. And I think uh, that people use this a lot when they're wanting to uh, kind of semi-locate something where you're hosting uh, a client's stuff, and then maybe they have something in the same region, and there may be some dependency between the two that you don't want to go over the internet. Uh, you can use these also with placement groups uh, with some limitations. And you can't do private DNS or security groups that span across uh, um, AZs. And basically, this is a simple concept of how that works. So you get to see these, these blocks need to be unique, or it won't work. Uh, another thing that's pretty useful uh, is uh, a lot of people don't realize, and they may have changed this very recently to be the default, but it hasn't for a very long time, is setting up an S3 endpoint. So if you don't have an S3 endpoint set up in your VPC, what's going to happen is when your stuff behind your VPC is going to access S3 and grab data, it's going to go out to the internet and then back in again, which is super slow. And if you have a NAT box involved, well, now you're putting all this load on this NAT instance running that could get overloaded just by transferring large files all the time. So um, if you set up an S3 endpoint, it lets it internally and not have to go out to the internet and back in again to access S3. Uh, much, much faster for transferring large files. Uh, and then it can't cost you any you know, traffic. So all you need to do is go in the console, and there's an option on the left that says S3 endpoints, and you're done. 
So uh, I, I see that a lot when I go in and look at a client's stuff. They don't have that set up, and they're wondering why S3 is so slow. It's a simple thing you can do. Uh, you can do IAM roles. Uh, this is just sort of general uh, Amazon th uh, advice here for security is, um, you know, you can't even use the root account anymore, and you should never use that, and it should always have MFA on it. Um, every user should always have MFA on it. So multi MFA is multi-factor authentication, so that means you need to have two things that they know to be able to get in in case things are compromised. Uh, a lot of places that haven't done this, have, uh, bad things have happened. Uh, I think there was a source code hosting company where someone got into their servers. Uh, they didn't have uh, any MFA on their admin accounts. Someone got in and then uh, blackmailed them. If you didn't pay a ransom by a certain time, we were going to delete your whole infrastructure. And sure enough, they deleted their whole infrastructure and all of their backups, which were also on Amazon. So that company was done, game over, right? So <laughs> probably be a good idea to have some backups somewhere else too, maybe on another cloud service. And just always set that up. I know IAM is kind of a pain. It's so complex. Uh, you need to use resource level security, though, for anyone you give accounts to, and you really need to lock that stuff down. Don't just give people admin access to everything. Uh, I've seen developers accidentally delete prod servers or make a change that um, not quite knowing what they were doing, takes a, a group of servers down or something like that and test them. That's the uh, key thing, is when you set up these IAM roles and policies on your accounts, make sure you actually test them and log in as a test user, because uh, a lot of people think it, they've got it right and it looks right, and then you log in and it's like, you can do things you shouldn't, and um, sometimes the simulator doesn't do that, but at least use the policy simulator if you can. A couple other things, uh, just really basic stuff here. Just remember on Amazon, if you uh, reboot a machine from the console, uh, it will keep in place, you'll stay on that same server when it comes back on and you access it. Um, and uh, your ephemeral storage, which is the hard drives that are attached to the physical machine when you spin it up, versus uh, elastic block volume is a you know, network attached type of storage. Uh, you can keep it there. But if you stop an instance, all that stuff goes away. So if you're using any kind of ephemeral storage, like maybe there were native SSD disks that come with a certain instance type, uh, people use that for real high performance stuff. That means if you stop it and then start it again, it's gonna come up on a different server somewhere else. All of your state is gone. So uh, only thing that would remain was it would be an attached EBS volume. A uh, couple tips you can do for saving money with um, VPN is you can run OpenVPN instead of their uh, solution. Uh, and you can run it on a tiny instance. And that way you're not metered by the hour of, of per connection uh, that people connect to it. You can just have pay for one instance and basic traffic and that, in a lot of cases, saves people a bunch of money. And I think sometimes that's easier to uh, um, administer. Uh, another tip here is uh, elastic load balancers. So uh, always create internal ELBs. So those would be things that are attached to subnets inside of your VPC. And there's two types now. There's an ELB and called an ALB application load balancer. And that allows you to place things in a placement groups versus directly attaching it to EC2 instances. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things to keep in mind if you're doing any kind of lift and shift operation to Amazon is that there's a 3600 seconds timeout. Um, that seems like why would anyone ever make a web app that has a pause that long? And I worked at a place they did and they wanted to move everything over to Amazon and this is a huge problem. It was a big data analytics dashboard that analyzed all this data and it took like minutes to come up and they didn't want to rewrite it because the people that wrote it were long gone. And um, so keep those kinds of things in mind. Uh, there used to be a way you could get it set up further if you contact their support people and they'll set a timer that's higher. Uh, but I don't think you want to put yourself in that position if you don't need to. Uh, another problem is uh, sticky source IP with HTTPS, since it can't really decrypt traffic in, in play. Um, that can be a, an issue as well that you need to watch out for. Uh, and, and they do a good job, and with the ALB stuff, they've definitely added a lot of functionality with uh, these ELBs, but some people have really advanced types of setups, so you can use uh, software like HA Proxy and do all of that yourself from an, uh, your own EC2 instance and do some really funky stuff where you're like, you know, changing traffic in play or uh, altering uh, things or having really complex load balancing strategies. Uh, that's what you want to do if you need something beyond what the simple thing offers you. But I think most people are fine with the basic stuff. 
All right. EBS instances, I definitely think, are the way to go for most people. If you're just doing a standard kind of, kind of web platform uh, that you, know, you can start and stop things and they'll come back up, uh, no problem. Um, it used to be a lot of people would be doing EBS-backed instances with baking AMIs and stuff. Now you can use Docker, and that's much easier. But always use a build server, um, so you can do that on-the-fly automation. Um, and that way, any kind of ephemeral stuff, if it gets thrown away, isn't a problem. Uh, one, another thing that I see that burns people a lot is when they spin up uh, instances uh, on applications uh, like Rails apps specifically, because they, you know, we know that they're, they're a little bit heavy on memory usage. Uh, is that there's no swap by default on almost all the instances. So what's going to happen is if you over allocated your JVM um, uh, too much RAM, then the system's getting starved. It can't swap to anything because a bunch of people complain that. Uh, swapping was on by default, and when you're accessing EBS volumes, that costs money. So they didn't want to have to pay for swapping, which if you're swapping a lot, can actually end up being a significant cost across many servers. So uh, you have to make sure to enable a swap by default on these things when you're building the servers and standing them up, or um, uh, you, what'll happen is in Java, you'll get the OOM killer uh, on a Linux box. So if your thing over allocates memory, it'll OM killer will kill your Grails app, or it'll kill the largest thing, basically. And you maybe um, have engineers running around figuring out why is the website not responsive every hour because it's running out of memory and rebooting the app. Uh, and then you'd look in the log and I'm like, oh, I don't see any exceptions. Nothing looks wrong. I've seen people spend a lot of time trying to figure that out when that was this was the root cause. Uh, EBS backed instances, so there's two types of ones. There's EBS supported ones and there's ones that support ephemeral. Um, uh, by default, even if it has ephemeral disk, like a high speed SSD drive attached to the instance you spin up, it doesn't um, automatically mount and load that uh, on most of the OSs. So it's up to you to add in startup scripts for the OS to make sure that you've got, uh, if you want to use those disks, you have to mount and format them yourself uh, when the system's booting. Um, and that can make a big difference in performance. I've, a friend of mine was hosting a company, uh, and he switched over to, um, from EBS to native SSD instances, and he was able to drop like three quarters of the amount of servers he had because the, it, they were so much more responsive. All right, let's talk about S3 storage a little bit. Uh, this is their object storage, basic uh, you know, block stuff you can put stuff on. Uh, so what are some... Uh, some of the limitations of this. So uh, it's a guy, the only promise they give you is eventual consistency. So what does that mean? Well, this is a whole cluster of servers, right? So if you write a file to it uh, and then try to immediately read it, it may not actually be there because the server you're reading it from, it may not have gotten there yet. So you have to be patient. And when you're writing applications, it means to make sure to pull and retry until, until it finds what it's looking for, if you're sure it's supposed to be there. Otherwise, it may just read, fail, give up, and app crashes, right? That's, if you take an old traditional app, that's a problem. Um, and as of a couple years ago, uh, US East used to not even have a guarantee of that kind of consistency in a certain time period, and they, uh, because it's so large, but they've actually fixed that. Uh, if you're doing S3, uh, it works great for small files. Large files over five gigabytes um, I found a lot of tools don't even handle those properly. It's because they have to be my multi-part encoded, and of course that's going to blow up the actual size of them while you're transferring them. Uh, some of these tools that work pretty good, S3, CMD, Cyberduck, so there's some tools here, uh, depending on what OS you use, work pretty good for just giving users access to S3 storage to uh, use that to put things in share files. So just keep in mind that large files will be slow because of that. Uh, some tools, there's, I, I love this one, S3FS. Uh, so you can mount S3 bucket as a file system on Linux, um, but it has limitations. And if you don't understand what the eventual consistency thing means, and you mount this as a file system, uh, you could put an application in there accessing data, and it could maybe writing data, and then read that data in the code on the next line, and all of a sudden, it's not there. And what's going on? It's because the eventual consistency hasn't happened yet. That, that, if you use something like this, you've got to make sure that application is smart enough to know to reload that data and retry, uh, or it'll just basically erratically fail. Uh, one example of that was uh, I saw someone put a database <laughs> on S3, and they were reading and creating tables, and then it would be like 
Create, create table, add rows, read rows, table not found. What? <laughs> you know, they didn't understand what was happening and that, how that eventual consistency can burn you. Um, to install this on most of the Linux boxes, you just need to make sure this thing fuse things in the kernel. And then um, uh, there's a, in the links here at the end, I've got, you know, it's got a, there's a guide of how to walk you through getting all the dependencies installed for it. So here's some other tools here that I, that I found were pretty decent. So, and then here's the link here to install S3FS. Uh, if you know it's under limitations, it's fine to use, but if you don't, it's like giving someone a, a, a gun that doesn't know how to use it and they shoot themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That's, a, that's a, a new thing that kind of helps people not have to do all that stuff directly, absolutely. No, no, this is not. This is a third-party thing someone else made. Most things aren't recommended by them, but people find a way to shoot themselves. Yeah, yeah, you have to, I would say, use with extreme caution. All right, so let's talk about uh, S3. So um, there used to be a lot of plugins for Grails 2 that were needed because it didn't have things like Gradle. So there was a lot of plugins um, that are gone now because they're just not even necessary anymore with Grails 3. Since Grails 3 is based off of you know, Boot and Gradle, we can use all of the Gradle plugins. So no one's ported really anything but a couple, really a couple, small handful of plugins to work with Grails. So uh, here's a, I've got a, a little demo here. Here's the S3 Gradle plugin. So I'll show you a few of these plugins that you might find useful. Uh, that are, some of them are Grails plugins, some of them are uh, uh, S3 um, or Gradle versus Grails plugins. All right, so here's a simple uh, application that uses you know, Gradle here. And all you have to do to make it work, uh, you set up a bucket uh, what profile you want to use out of your credentials file uh, is what I, I usually use. And then you can programmatically add files to upload and download here. So if I want to download, uh, upload this file, let's just say I'll stick the uh, build.gradle in an S3 bucket. So I can go ahead and just, you know, run the S3 upload task, and it's going ahead and put the file up there. I know a lot of people use this for, like, configuration files and things like that in their application, so they'll load those into a bucket somewhere and then read them, um, and that way, um, if they ever need to change them, they don't need another application deploy, right? And then I can do the same thing and just download this file again, and it's gonna go ahead and, and download this file, and I just tack, I'm just tacking on dot .downloaded so I know which one's which. Uh, pretty simple plugin. All you have to do is add these dependencies here, and, uh, and you're good to go. It's not, not really a whole lot to it. It's a pretty basic plugin. Might be useful for doing things in your automation. All right, let's talk about the Grails plugins that are, do exist for th Grails 3x because you don't need very many of them. Uh, there's the main one is called the Grails AWS plugin that's um, maintained by uh, Benoit over at Agora Pulse. And it used to support like every possible service, but it didn't really add any value. It was just a really simple wrapper around each one of the Java SDKs for it. Uh, so now what he's done is, uh, you know, brought that down to a smaller list of services. And then those, and of those services, the Grails plugin actually adds some kind of value to it, make it easier. Um, we've got the AWS SDK plugin. Um, uh, this guy right here, this, this is not Benoit's. This is a, one that was never finished porting. So don't use this one. You'll see it there, and it looks kind of complete, and it's actually listed in our Grails 3 plugins. Uh, but if you get into the code, you look at like most of it's commented out and it doesn't work. So don't, don't use that one. Use the AWS SDK plugin. This is the good one. That's the one Benoit maintains that has all those services in it. We also have another plugin called, um, that Dave Estes does, the guy that does the asset pipeline called Carmen plugin. And so this is kind of a cloud file abstraction library. So what you can do is kind of build um, uh, in your code, something that would access something like a bucket, but you're not hard coding it to use Amazon's S3 or Google Cloud's type of thing. Uh, it kind of abstracts that. I'll show you that here. 
standardized interface. We can store files. It supports AWS, OpenStack, Rackspace, and Azure right now. Uh, and there's the source for it. And it's got a nice little guide with an example. And basically, um, it also does local storage. So you can make it store files locally if you want to, and then just change a config file, and now it's reading from Azure or you know, AWS. It's pretty useful. And this is what the code looks like to basically set that up. You, you can put your access key stuff in here, and then uh, when you use it, it's just simply provider and then get a file, and then you're good to go. All right, let's talk about the uh, SDK plugin. This is probably the most useful one. Uh, again, it only uses a select set of services now. But uh, he always makes you, uh, you're always able to get, even if this plugin doesn't provide access to get what you want on it, for example, S3 or something like that, he always keeps the Java client reference accessible within the service you call. So that means you can always get to that one anyway. And if the plugin doesn't do what you want, you can, it still sets everything up for you credential wise. And then you can access that. Now, I've got a little demo I'll show you. So uh, what are the services supported? So it does DynamoDB. It's got a neat little, uh, it's not quite GORM, but it does give you annotate beans and use those as uh, uh, tables and attributes in, uh, in, in your Grails app. It supports S3. Um, it supports Kinesis, uh, SES, and SNS, and SQS. And that's it. So it used to support like almost everything you can think of, even Glacier. I think that became too hard to maintain. And then again, if it's not really adding any super value on the Grail side, then why even have it? All right. So DynamoDB plugin. Uh, this, this is like a sub plugin of it, I guess you'd say. Uh, it uses a, a thing called DynamoDB Mapper. And because there is no current GORM that works with DynamoDB, there was upon a time, but it is, hasn't been maintained uh, because no one's really wanted to sponsor that or work on it, I guess. So this is probably your best bet to make a Grails app interact with uh, Dynamo. And you can use annotations like DynamoDB table, so you just annotate your class with that. Uh, and then you use DynamoDB attributes for all your properties that you want to be stored. Here's, here, there's all the docs uh, and examples for it. So let me take, let's take a look at that. I've got an, an example to show you. So here I've got a um, thing here. Let me show you the S3 first. So all you have to do to use this in your Grails controller is use the Amazon S3 service. And um, you can just set up an instance of that, and it'll go through the credential chain locally and then uh, find that. So it'll look in your .home directory under .aws, grab the credentials, and do all that. So here I've got something that lists all the buckets. So simple as just calling the service list bucket names. Uh, you can extend this to make a dedicated service for a bucket, if that's important for you. You just need to extend uh, their class and then give it a static uh, name right here called bucket name, and then it would always use that bucket for every operation you do in that service. Uh, this one's just using um, browsing service, you know, browsing buckets, so we don't really care. Um, and we can go ahead and create a bucket, see if they exist. We're going to show them in a the Grails app, and you can even delete buckets from here. And then the other part of this app demo is this um, bucket object controller. So basically, this is using a mix of what the uh, service provides you and the client. So this is an example underneath. So if I can't get this operation because I want to get to that through the Grails plugin, I can, it sets it up for you. And you just say the Amazon S3 service.client, and then all the Java stuff's right there. And you can use it, and it's all set up and ready to go. So in this case, I'm listing them out to paginate uh, what's in there. So when I go show that, you know, I can just uh, give me a list of the buckets I have in my uh, account right here. And then here's a list of sounds we use for the Alexa stuff for to play back um, right here. And I can go ahead and download these files and grab them and things like that. So I can download it here and then play it. And you can you know, delete the whole bucket and do all that stuff. That's just a quick demo that you, use that you can use with the Grails plugin that is pretty useful. All right, one other thing I want to show you, Grails-wise, is uh, here's an example of using, uh, making a little quiz service. So this is something we use in the Alexa uh, talk 
or it's a quiz, and it's a list of quiz items with options you pick. So it's that demo running in the OCI booth out there. Uh, it's using DynamoDB table to store all that data. And you can do all that here in a Grails controller. Uh, query the items out of the list here. Um, and basically, you make a service for each one of these that extends uh, his service. So here, abstract DB service. And then you give it what your bean name is of what kind of things represented in that table. So in this case, I've got a quiz item. And then we look at the quiz item, and it's just a bean. I've used these annotations. It says DynamoDB table. This is a Star Trek quiz uh, we're making. Uh, define what the hash key is, range keys. Uh, basically annotated here, and that's it. Pretty simple. So if we look at that, come on, internets. All right, so here's a list of items in my DynamoDB table. I'm just able to pull these things out, show them in a Grails app, paginated, and I've got, here's all the answer. So I was just messing around here, and then I can create new items. And this is a heck of a lot easier than using their console. So, you know. Say, what is the weather, or something like that. Let's say the op correct answer is number two. We'll say it's partly cloudy. If I could spell. Oh, fire. Hopefully we don't have fire weather ever. Um, and then we go in here and we can see we're just saving this, calling it to the service, and then we're done. And now that appears in there, in the thing. So it's pretty, pretty easy to work with this stuff. All right, let's skip over that. Um, Kinesis, it supports that. Um, I don't know if, you, if you're not familiar with Kinesis. It's a, a message broker for distributed logs, similar to Ka Kafka. Uh, here's a good guide of the two. So there's actually some use cases that are better than others for either one. All you need to do to use this is uh, there's an Amazon Kinesis service, uh, service it gives you, and then you can uh, do things like um, send, send messages into the queue and uh, check for messages. Uh, I find this really useful. I've, I've used this in a real-world case with a AWS Lambda, because you can trigger a Lambda from a Kinesis message queue and then process that stuff later. It also supports SES. That's called Simple Email Services. Uh, instead of using an SMTP gateway, you can actually use this plugin and then use a GSP page as a template for the email you want to send out. So um, having that GSP page all set up with that renders all nice in HTML and then taking a you know, snapshot of that, you don't need to mess around with any HTTP client stuff when you call it. You just uh, call the service and tell it when you want and then send the email and you're good to go. It also supports SQS service, so that's managing you know, message queue. Uh, I don't use this as much anymore because there isn't a way to directly link it with lambdas. So I always end up using Kinesis instead, um, unless you, you, you write the code to process that stuff yourself. Typically uses a quartz job that would pull for messages and um, stay in the queue for 12 hours. All right, and it also supports SNS, Simple Notification Service. This is really useful for sending messages between applications, or you can do mobile. Uh, you can also do Lambda, and so that kind of helps things communicate between each other. You, you, you can manage the topics with this plugin, create, delete, publish, all that. Also, un pub and unsub via SMS. All right, so I only got a couple minutes left. I'm going to show you there's some of the, there's a Gradle plugin that's useful. Uh, these are the ones that you probably will care about. There's a Gradle CDN asset pipeline plugin that Dave, uh, it's not Dave Estes, I think Benoit actually made this, if I'm not mistaken. And that just allows you to push assets to CDNs, and it really only supports uh, Amazon right now because it requires you to put uh, all the assets as a staging area in S3. You've got your Grail ABS plugin. Uh, this really replaces most of the plugins that Grails used to use. You don't need them anymore uh, because this does it all via Gradle scripts. It can do access most of the common services people need. That's what I use when I normally do stuff like pushing Alexa skills and whatnot. I'm using the AWS plugin. They also have a pretty good, if you're using Beanstalk, there's a great old Beanstalk plugin that lets you deploy wars directly to Beanstalk, and that works great for Grails apps as well. I've got some links in here on using that, um, a walkthrough of you've got a Grails app, and I want to push this to Beanstalk with this plugin. All right.
a little bit about the asset pipeline plugin. Uh, here's a little bit about the uh, Gradle plugin. I use this again. I've got like a template. Um, I've got a lazy bone template for Alexa, but you can use it for you know, Lambda as well, where it'll spit out a project that's got uh, Gradle and everything all set up in with your groovy jars um, to help you um, push Lambdas. And then here's an example of the Beanstalk plugin. Um, good walkthrough right there. Perfect. Uh, the other tool, Sugar. So um, this guy over here is a talk up next. You definitely check it out. Uh, it's a groovy based DSL library for working with remote servers through SSH. So um, he'll, I'll, he'll explain it in his talk, but you can basically connect, remote execute commands, copy files and directories, you can create tunnels. All of that works as a Gradle plugin. So you could technically make some kind of Ansible type of thing based off of Groovy by combining this with a Gradle and a Groovy DSL. It would be pretty neat to do instead of YAML files. All right, so I gotta wrap it up. I'm out of time here. I've got a link here. I'll post these slides uh, with all these links of all the stuff that I used. Uh, to find all the good plugins that work and the ones that don't, you can avoid. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>